All right, recording now. It's excuse me, February twenty second, twenty twenty one. We are still at home um, because of water issues at the school, and we are on pharmacology. Okay, we're about to go into the lecture, but first we're going to go over a few key points. I'm not going to go through one through seventy in this workbook, but I'm a Start out on Word Wizard. See if anybody had any questions on the Word Wizard. Then I'll go on to the next uh, couple of units, a couple of pages. And if anybody has any specific questions on it, then we'll go over it. Okay. But the uh, the the workbook is an excellent tool that will get you in your Egan's book, and it follows along because a lot of this stuff you didn't hear me say in the lecture, and it just gives you more uh, information to better yourself in pharmacology because like I said it's a whole lot of um, information in pharmacology that you got to remember and so understanding how these drugs work and how our system works on these drugs right uh, what what's happening to us is very important okay all right clean this thing up I think this will be clean today I have my airways I went to the school and picked up a few things since we couldn't teach at school. I went and got my airway. It's just this bronchoconstriction. Notice how it's it's uh, concave like that because this right here, this right here is the actual muscle. This is the bronchial smooth muscles that tighten up. See how it's tightened up on the airway, so it's looking like a spool of, of thread, right? It's just like that. Then you also have your mucus that can become uh, trapped inside of the airway. So now you have a small airway with mucus in there, makes it very small. That's bronchoconstriction. Breath sounds you may hear ronchi and wheezes, the whoo sound, right? High pitch wheezes or low pitch wheezes, uh, which are ronchi, okay? In a bronchoconstriction. Then you have. <clears throat> First, we would have, this is normal. This is a normal airway. You got the nice pink insides, right? Um, let's see if I can that well. Nice pink insides. Uh, it is the good shape. Look at look at this. See how it, you got a little bit of tone to the, uh, the muscles. It's not as much as this one, right? See that? See how these muscles have squeezed in and caused that airway to get small. This is normal tone here. Right, this is just how it is. You have your parasympathetic working and your sympathetic working together, pulling on the same thing to keep it open in the middle. The parasympathetic wants to close it and the sympathetic wants to open it, right? But if they're working against each other, they keep it stretched open at the normal uh, range or normal shape, okay? Normal tone. And then, so you get a asthma contraction or you have reactive airway where you got some bland aerosol in the airway and it caused you to constrict or somebody came along with that Mary Kay perfume that's just so cheap and so strong that it made you constrict, right? So you go from normal tone to constriction, right? You're gonna learn when we get to restrictive and, and, um, and obstructive diseases themselves, what causes different constrictions in our restrictive airways. Uh, but like this, <clears throat> asthma can cause a constriction like this, bland aerosol, like I said, perfume or cologne, uh, temperature, right? If you go outside and breathe really, really cold air, it can make you constrict, okay? So, and certain drugs. So now we have that after we had normal tone, we had an asthma attack and this is what it looks like. Then we take our... Um, adrenergic bronchodilator, right? Which are those specific adrenergic bronchodilators that you should know or be on the way to knowing at this point. So for instance, isoetherene. What is the trade name for isoetherene? Bronchosol. Bronchosol. So you take bronchosol, which has some nice little beta one and beta two effects. Um, and then you have bronchodilation. So you go from normal to constriction, to take an adrenergic bronchodilator, and now you have bronchodilation, right? Notice how it's almost no dip. Now, that smooth muscle has relaxed so much that the airway now is stretched open. This is bronchodilation, okay? 
All right. So uh, before we get into the word, word, uh, word, worm, or, okay, word wizard, we're going to do this poll. I want everybody to take this poll that I'm about to put on your screen. All right. And let's see if I can make it bigger. Can everybody see the poll on my screen? Can everybody see it? No, it's a poll in progress. Yeah, do you see the questions? No. I can see it on my screen, pharmacology poll. Yeah, pharmacology questions. Number one, lever albuterol is a generic. You should see one, two, and three right now. Y'all don't see three questions? I see three questions. Okay. Go ahead and start the polling at this point. Answer one, two, and three right now. Then I'm going to scoot it up and let you do four through, I think it's like five or six questions. So y'all work on that for a moment. I'm going to have to log out and log back in because I don't see it. Okay. Yeah, do that because I don't know what was on. must be something on your end that's causing it not to show up, but it's, it's definitely on there. All right. Yeah, it's on mine. All right, got a lot of little answers. Now I'm not, you know, I'll tell you what they are as we go. I'm gonna scoot on up. Oh, you look like y'all can see all of them. Y'all can see all the questions? Yeah, you just got it. Oh, okay, I didn't know, I thought I had to move. Well, good, take the poll. And we have a total of 15 people on here, so uh, I think it's 14 students. So I'm only having a certain amount of people answer these questions. So go through and answer all the questions. Try to answer them without your, your notes. See what you know, because this is what's showing you and showing me what, uh, what our strong points are or not. If you go right to your notes and answer, that's, that's not really helping because it's not a right or wrong answer as far as grades are concerned. If, if you can just look in your notes, then that means you just looked in your notes. But if you can do these off the top of your head without looking, that lets you know, hey, I got them all. So you're helping yourself on, or matter of fact, you're harming yourself if you're not doing it without your notes. <clears throat> there we go. We got more people in here now doing some stuff. We got 10, 11, okay. Got about four more students who are not responding. I need everybody to respond. I should see 15 responses to each question or 14. I think I am the 14th, the 15th person. No, it's 15, yeah, it's 15 students. I'm, I'm in stress, so they're not counting me. So it's 15 students in here. I should see 15 responses.
All right. So I got, looks like 14 on all of them. All right, so let's go ahead and go. I think we're just missing one. I think Christian said it needs to uh, upload or, or download or something like that. Update. Did you say update, Christian? It ended up working for me when I logged back in. I just uh, chatted to your intelligence. Oh. Okay. So who has not responded? Have you responded, Christian? Yes, I did all five. Oh, okay, because I'm missing one person. We got 15 students in here. Yeah, I did all five. Somebody, somebody hasn't done it. All right, so let's go over right quick and then we'll, we'll move on. Here we go. All right. Number one, Lev Albuterol. Lev Albuterol is the generic name for Zopinex. 12 people out of 14 have it. So 86% of the class chose Zopinex. Good. That's the correct answer. Lev Albuterol is the generic name for Zopinex. Beta 2 stimulation. Beta 2. When we have beta 2 stimulation, that is bronchodilation. 11 people said bronchodilation. Three of y'all said bronchoconstriction, All right? You got to know beta 2. That's Beta 2 is your main, uh, like him and cyclic 3,5 AMP, they go hand in hand. Beta 2 stimulation results in an increase in production of cyclic 3,5 AMP, which gives us bronchodilation. Bronchodilation, number three. Alpha stimulation results in vasoconstriction. 79% said that. One person said bronchodilation and one person said tachycardia. Number four, Brycanal is the trade name of what drug? That should be terbutylene sulfate. 79% said that. Metaproteranol, y'all said two, 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 two people said that and then one person said isoethylene. And then number five, what part of the nervous system uses acetylcholine as its neurotransmitter? Three people said sympathetic. And 80% said parasympathetic, which is correct. Parasympathetic nervous system uses acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. So this right here lets me know that everybody on the, in the class that took this poll is not on the same length. You know what I'm saying? Not on the same path with this. I need everybody, I was hoping to see at least one answer that had 100% of the class said it, and none of them did, okay? So that's how I uh, can um, judge where we are as a class with this, okay? So you gotta study. This is, this is something that's not getting ready to just fall in your head. All right, so let's go on. Any questions, let me see. Number one on the um, Airway Pharmacology Word Wizard, uh, let me get a pull up that those answers. All right, let me see who's all in here. Yeah, let's do it like this. All right. All right, Michael, in number one. Indication. What is that? I got D, which is reason for giving a drug to a patient. Good. All right. Shatara, number two. Number two, tolerance. What is that? You talking about at the work, Mr. McCart? So that really yeah. is. Just... Yeah, the workbook. You can get it, and I'll come back to you. Okay. You said number two. Yeah. All right, Kiara. Number three. Adrenergic, Kiara. What is that? 
Gary, come on, go, go at Mother. Yeah, you with me? Yeah. All right, Courtney, number three. Drugs, I mean, uh, uh, adrenergic, Courtney. Uh, I got F. F as in simple? No, F as in Frank. Oh, okay. Yeah, good. Drugs that mimic the effect of epinephrine. Those are your adrenergic bronchodilators, right? You have sympathetic, a.k.a. adrenergic, a.k.a. sympathomimetic. Good. All right, number four. Uh, Sydney, number four. Okay, so I. I, good. A drug that exerts a constricting effect on the blood vessel. That is a vasopressor. A vasopressor. We take those to increase blood pressures uh, like epinephrine. Epinephrine would also be a vasopressor. Makes that blood pressure goes up because it has a lot of alpha, right? A lot of alpha. All right, Kelsey, number five. J. Five is J. Giving it a, a, a pro drug. So that's something I didn't say, right? But something that you know. A pro drug is given in an inactive form that converts it to an active let me see, I can't see all of them. Oh, for, to, to active in the body. That's a pro drug. New, that's new for me. All right. Number six. Um, Heather, number six. Muscarinic. What is muscarinic? C. C, good. Effect of acetylcholine on the smooth muscle. Yeah. Mute your mic. I bought my whole family with Next time. Mute your mic, guys, especially if y'all going to be playing music in the background. Mute your mic. All right, Cassidy. Number seven. Pharmacodynamic. What is that, Cassidy? L. Is it what? L. L, good. L, phase related to the mechanism of action. How does it do what it does, right? Number eight. Uh, so back to Michael. And so uh, Shatara, number eight. Shatara. Okay, Michael, number eight. I got E. E. Good. Uh, Stephanie, number nine. I got B. Number nine is B. Good. Um, Talisha, number 10. What is a leukotrin? Compound S compounds that produce allergic or inflammatory responses. Good. Number 11. Number 11. Uh, Brittany, number 11. Okay. Okay, dilation of the pupil of the eye. So when somebody's eyes are pup uh, dilated, that's called midriasis. Midriasis. All right. And that is when you have, so if I have midriasis, say something happens to me and I have midriasis, what would you say, which, which nervous system would I not be using anymore? Something happened and knocked out that part of my nervous system. Which nervous system would it be? Parasympathetic. Sympath parasympathetic. So if something happens, a brain injury, at the brain stem, uh, and we know the parasympathetic works off the uh, sacral and the brain stem, right? That's where the parasympathetic nervous system lies, down in your sacral spine and in your, <clears throat> your brain stem area up at the top. So you have an accident that hits or damages that brain stem, you're going to have a loss of your parasympathetic nervous system, okay? If you have an accident that does something to your thoracic and your lumbar, then you're going to have a problem with your sympathetic. That's why I showed you where they are on the actual uh, spinal column. So somebody who has had an accident or an issue, um, somebody who has an um, issue with midriasis, it's because they have some type of issue with their spinal cord, at the, you know, the brain or spinal cord, at the stem or at the uh, sacral, okay? Midriasis. All right. 
Number 12. Kenya, number 12. And y'all, let me step away. Kenya, what's number 12? Q. Q, okay, let me look. Number 12, Kenya. All right, so you said Q. Yes, sir. The 12? Correct. Okay, 12 is G. 12 will be G. Agonist means it has a receptor affinity and exerts an effect. When somebody's an, something is an agonist, it will go to that receptor site and cause an effect, okay? All right. Let's up the front. Number 13. Okay, so Michael did that one. All right, so Talisha, number 13. What you get for 13? 13 is pharmacokinetic. 13 is T, say is related to metabolic system of a drug. Good. Can, oh, not can, I'm sorry. Uh, charisma. Charisma, what you get for 14? Cholinergic. What is 14? H. H, mimics the effect of acetylcholine. All right, Courtney, 15. An antagonist. I got, uh, I got Q. Q has receptor affinity, but has no effect. So it actually goes and kind of blocks it, right? Something that blocks the effects. All right, Heather, number 16. Uh, I put R. 16 is R, rapidly develop, developing tolerance. All right, Michael, and number 18. 18 is peak effect. What is the peak effect? M. M, good. Maximum effect form of a drug, right? It, at its peak. If you took a pain pill of a toothache, because we know a toothache can be ridiculous, right? If you've been around long enough, you'll have one. And it's worse than, I would say worse than childbirth. Now, y'all say childbirth hurt, but man, a toothache, a real deal toothache. And that's not a joke, okay? Anybody here had a real deal toothache? Not chipped, cold, or oh, the water was cold. Nothing like that. I'm talking about real deal toothache. Like, oh my God, shoot me. Yes, I had dry okay. socket and it was so yeah. bad. So your tooth could be hurting. You'll be, I, I used to be rubbing my top of my head just to get it. To, I mean, whatever you could do. You can't lay down because the blood is pumping towards your head when you lay down. That's boom, boom, boom. It's ridiculous. I don't work, wish that on my worst enemy. So if you, you take a sleep. medicine, you start feeling that toothache because any any kind of relief with a toothache you'll feel okay oh it's, it's getting a little bit better oh it's getting a little bit better and then when it's gone that's the peak effect the drug is working at maximum potential then that toothache start coming back it's now it's, it's falling back off okay so peak effect is at the top when it's no more pain or whatever you were trying to take it for number 19 maria number 19 duration 
got, oh, good. How long the drug effects last? Good. <clears throat> All right. Guys, on these on these assignments, they they the, you have to look at the date. It says the due date. It says the due date of when it when it's due. I had one that's due on the 18th, one was due on the 19th, and then one was due on the 22nd, which is today, by 12 o'clock. You have to look at the due date. They're on there, so I don't understand how y'all are getting it mixed up on what day is due, uh, unless I said something different somewhere. But it's definitely on the actual assignment. Okay. Um, So I, I don't know what else to say, uh, but we'll talk about that after class. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So then now we got duration. Number 19 is duration. Do we already do not 19? Yeah, we did. Okay. So Cassidy, A. Ca I mean, Cassidy, number 20. Half-life. I, I, huh? I got it. Got A. Okay. Half-life is time it takes to metabolize half of the drug. All right. Hmm. All right, so let's take a 10 minute break. 10 minute break and then we'll come back and go any questions that you might have had on the workbook ask me we'll go to that if not we're going on with the actual lesson so 140 come back at 150 all right any questions on any of the um workbook pages It has some good information on there. Uh, these workbook pages, again, are excellent in helping you understand uh, whatever section we're on, like uh, the, the um, collidium bromide. We don't even talk about that, but I mean, some type of respiratory drug, I've never given it. But this is a new addition. So there are new medicines all the time. And what we're teaching are the basics, which is on the, the board exam, but there are some new uh, drugs out there that you know we, we gotta when you're doing the workbook and the reading you'll see them so when you get out in the field you'll see more than maybe that you learn okay it's new medicines are being made all the time there's no way you can keep up with it as far as t testing on it every time it'll be something different every 10 weeks but um that's why you have to do your own research and stay in it so that you can be abreast on it when you go out there in the field okay all right, if not, then we're going to move on to the actual lesson plan. So let me pull that up. Share my screen. All right. All right, go down to where we left off. Again, make sure you know these specific bronchodilators. You need to know these um, by heart now because I mean, you have to memorize. Because you know, I might say the trade name isopril uh, is for what drug? You didn't know that is isoprostrenol. I might ask you what drug has plus four beta one, plus four beta two. Uh, and it's a one to 200 concentration. You need to know that's isoproteranol, also known as isopril. You have to know that, okay? I'm not gonna put on there a question say, which drug has a dosage of 0.25 to uh, QI? It's not gonna be that uh, detailed. It's gonna be more maybe part of the question, but it won't be just something like that by itself. There's gonna be something else in the question that will let you know what drug they're talking about. Uh, you will see that one CC maximum got to know what that is. That's the bronchosol. That's a one cc maximum. And then 
the uh, metaproteranol sulfate is a 0.3 mL maximum. Okay, you wouldn't even know how to do drug dose calculations, but don't spend your whole study session on that. It might be two or three questions of drug dose calculations. It's mostly the meat and potatoes of how the body reacts to the medicine, what's happening, what's being transported or, or converted, you know, to, to, to cause this or cause that. All right, so we ended up talking about, um, talked about the side effects, we talked about exanthines, we talked about the steroids, all right? Now, we're in long-acting bronchodilators. Now, you're going to see some of the long-acting bronchodilators are a mixture of a steroid and a bronchodilator mixed together, right? We will talk about some of these. Now, long-acting bronchodilators, they are, that's what they, that's what they say. They last for a longer period of time, but you need to know. Look at this right here. Long-acting bronchodilators are not for emergency. These are not your rescue drugs, right? Salmeterol xenophoate. Salmeterol. You don't see xenophoate, you just see salmeterol. That is the generic name for Cerevent. Cerevent. Okay, this is a long acting bronchodilator. Okay, long acting bronchodilator. Oh, okay. Oh, we ain't going to do this all day. I hate that little blue line. It just, it, it, it irks me. All right, salmeterol is the generic name for cerevent, which comes as a DPI as 50 unigrams per blister, right? Uh, a blister, again, is a little pill that once you put it inside of the container, you break it. So let me show you a, a dry powder inhaler. I don't have any blisters, but you can, a blister looks like a capsule that you would pop in your mouth, like a regular capsule that's got a little something inside of it, all right? This is an example of Spiriva. This is a Spiriva, right? Which is teotropium bromide. Teo, teotropium bromide is the generic name for Spiriva, okay? It also is a um, parasympatholytic or a anticholinergic drug. It's a dry powder uh, medicine. Okay, now this is how it looks. This is just one of them. This is a Spiriva, handheld Spiriva, right? Made by Pfizer. And the way that you do this one, is you open it up, right? And then you open the top. See that? See this little gate right here? You put your plastic blister, which is a little capsule, you drop it in there, and then you take the top, shut it, and then you crush it. See that moving inside there? Crush that peel up, usually one crush or two crush. If somebody COPD or that's been on it for long, a long time, you crush it more than once. Hey, don't be crushing it up like that, because sometimes those little plastics will get through that gate and they get in their mouth and they be mad at you, okay? So just one crush will crush that pill up and release the powder, right? That's called a blister. That little pill is called a blister, which contains the powder medicine that you want to give. DPI stands for dry powder inhaler. You put that in there, you crush it. Now your powder is ready, okay? The patient will put this in his mouth. And for dry powder inhalers, the breathing technique is one hard inhalation. That's it, okay? It's not a slow, deep inspiration, inhalation with an inspiratory hold. That's only for the aerosol drugs, okay? Aerosol, anything that comes out as an aerosol, whether it's in a nebulizer or an MDI, when you puff it, right? If it's aerosolized, it's slow, deep with an inspiratory hold. If it's a dry powder inhaler, then it's one, <laughs> because dry powder doesn't float. You have to suck it in hard and hope it gets in your lungs. I don't really understand because some of it's getting in the lungs, but like we talked about, I mean, like anything else, if I suck it hard, it's going to be in my mouth and the back of my throat. But, you know, they say it does work. It does get down in there. So, I mean, it's, it remains to be seen for me. Okay. I prefer just give me an aerosol. So I know that it's getting down in there, but that's how you do a DPI. Okay. So salmeterol 
uh, is the generic name for CeraVent that's giving as a dry powder inhaler. This is a Spareva dry powder inhaler. Let's look at another dry powder inhaler. This is a dry powder inhaler called the Ellipta, right? The Ellipta, same thing with here. Now the Ellipta is more expensive because the blisters are already inserted in here when you buy it. When you open out a full package, you pull this out, the blisters are already preloaded, okay? The blisters are preloaded and this is old. So you see it's red. It would have a number right here to let you know how many blisters are left. But this is so old, it's, once it's red, that means no blisters are left, right? This one expires 7-2016. So you know this was an old uh, demonstration, okay? But it's a de demonstration device. So what they do is they open it up like that. Once you open it like that, you load and you crush the blister. One stop. Pop it open and then you don't have to crush nothing. It's already pre-loaded. And as soon as you hear that, Every time you cock it open, it makes that blister ready for use. Okay, you put your mouth on it. One deep inhaler for a dry powder inhaler. So this is a Lipta, another type of dry powder inhaler. This is one I'm seeing you've seen on TV. This is Advair. I'm pretty sure you've seen this or somebody has it in your family or you've seen it on TV. This is Advair, okay? You're going to see it's a mixture of flucanas, fluticasone and salmeterol. So fluticasone and salmeterol together make Advair, okay? Same thing. It's a dry powder inhaler. Every one of them are the same thing, but maybe work a little different. To work this one, you pop it open, right? Once you do that, you expose the mouthpiece and the trigger. This is also preloaded with dry powder inhaler blisters, right? It's preloaded, okay? All you have to do is prime it. Once you do that, you set up another dry powder ready for inhalation. <sighs> okay, that's it. This is Advair, okay? Another long acting uh, bronchodilator type. It's almost like a um, prophylactic type. We'll see that when we get into the actual lesson, okay? So this is another dry powder inhaler. Or the other style. This is another style of dry powder inhaler. Okay. This one happens to be Pomocort. Pomocort. Okay. It's letting you know it's budesonide inhalation powder at 90 mcgs per inhalation. Okay. Same thing with this one, except for you'll take the lid off, right? And you will turn it. Every time you turn it, hear that. When you turn it, it's cocked, it's primed, it's ready to go. You put your mouth on the mouthpiece and suck it up, put the top back on. That's it. This is another old one that we have that expired in 2016. Okay. Palmer Court. Palmer Court. 90 micrograms. Uh, yeah, 90 micrograms per 60 doses. So it's got 60 doses in here. Uh, and it's a dry powder inhaler. Okay. So you have this style, you have the little egg style, you have the disc style, and you have this little rectangular or whatever. This is more new, like trilogy and stuff like that. They all like look like this. Okay. So all these trail, uh, the trilogy commercial, trilogy, tri all of that. That's what that is. It's a dry powder inhaler. You'll see it in the hospital when you get there. Okay. All right. Dry powder inhalers. I go up to the school and get all this stuff for my, for y'all today. All right. I got any more time. I think that's pretty much well, this is one. This is another dry dry powder inhaler. Here you may see one like this. I ain't really sure which one this is. You see this little that little perfect little oval spot right there? That's where you would lay your capsule, right? Which is your blister. I'm sorry, your blister. You lay the blister right in there. And then look, notice it's got a screen here so you don't inhale the plastic, right? You don't want to be inhaling plastic. Once you crush that blister, all thing gonna come through here is the powder. So you lay it in there, 
lock it in place, crush it, and then inhale. Put the top back on. I'm surprised I don't see anywhere what, what this is. This might just be a universal one that you can have if you have a blister and you want to use it this way. Okay, dry powder inhalers. Okay. Now, what about what about my MDI? Right, my uh, metered dose inhalers. All right. We also have something called now. This is a oh, this is just another dry powder, another color, which is just for demonstration, showing you how it works. Okay. Now, so those are my dry powder inhalers. That's what Simeterol comes in as a dry powder inhaler. Yes, on Friday, we talked about some of these medicines are in uh, meter dose inhalers, which are our little pumpers, right? Our little pumpers, okay? Well, that's what these look like. These are all meter dose inhalers, MDI. You have your canister, which your medicine comes in. This happens to be what? Albuterol inhalation aerosol, 17 grams per pump, okay? Oh, this is an older one, okay? It fits into the house, right? It is trade name, what's the trade name? Ventolin. Ventolin, remember Ventolin is one of the trade names for albuterol. What? You wet. Okay, let it change in a minute, okay? Come here. Go get your diaper bag. Go get your diaper bag, bring it back. Okay. All right, so this is an MDI, okay? I uh, want a slime bag. Okay, bring your slime bag. Now, with an MDI, guys, the best way to give an MDI to ensure good penetration and deposition, we use what's called a spacer. The aero chamber is a spacer that allows the patient to get a better inhalation from the medicine because it's hard to time this right in your mouth like that. A lot of that will be in your mouth. So somebody said, well, I'm going to invent something to go in between the MDI and the patient, and now they're trillionaires, okay, which I'm looking for y'all to do. So you insert your MDI into the chamber, and you squirt. Once you squirt, Slow, deep inhalation with an inspiratory hold because it's an aerosol, okay? This is an MDI, meter dose inhaler. This is actual aerosol coming out. And what's nice about it or sophisticated about it is every time you squirt it, you're going to get whatever it says. If it says 100 unit grams per puff, then that's what you, that's what, every time you hit it, that's a puff. That's going to be 100 in, uh, unit grams per puff, okay? This is one type of meter dose inhaler. Okay. Okay. All right. So let me let me pause for a minute, guys, and take care of this right quick. Okay, we're back uh, from the break, uh, and I was going over some uh, MDIs, and I showed some uh, just some different types here. This is an MDI, and we talked about uh, if I had albuterol in my hand and I had a steroid. This is a steroid, and this one was albuterol. If I have steroid and albuterol in my pocket, and I have an asthma emergency, which means what I use, the class said albuterol, which is correct, because it is a specific bronchodilator, right, adrenergic bronchodilator, that it works as a rescue agent immediately, okay, fast onset. And I said, how does it work? It works by uh, activating adenylate cyclase, which converts ATP into cyclic 3,5 AMP. Cyclic 3,5 AMP then gives us what? Bronchodilation. Bronchodilation. So the cyclic 3,5 AMP will give us bronchodilation. We had an asthma attack and we had bronchoconstriction. We took albuterol, which is an adrenergic bronchodilator and got uh, ATP converted over into cyclic 3,5 AMP, which gives us bronchodilation, okay? So you need to know that, okay? You need to know that route, that path for dilation, okay? All right. 
because those are the different types of MDIs and dry powder inhalers, all right? But what about the other type of medicine? What about just the regular aerosol, right? Well, regular aerosols look kind of like this, right? This is a SVN, which is a small volume nebulizer. Small volume nebulizer that when we use, uh, when we do a small volume nebulizer, we use little uh, vials, right? Vials of medicine like this. If you've ever seen these before, this is this is our vial medicine. Let me see what type of medicine this is. Yeah, like uh, breathing treatment. All of this is breathing treatments. Everything I just showed you is a breathing treatment. Whether it's a DPI, MDI, or a small volume nebulizer, they are all breathing treatments. Okay? Is there albuterol in there? Well, I'm about to show you. This one is, you might not can see it, but this is budesonide. Budesonide, which is a uh, steroid, okay? And so how this one works, these, you know, you just break them off of the, the tree, right? Just break it off, and then you would take the top off, right? And let me find something to put this in. And then you would just squirt it down into your medicine cup, right? Into your medicine cup, which is this is the medicine cup, right? You would squirt it down into the medicine cup, and then you would hook it up to your flow meter, okay? You have your small bore tubing. One end goes here, like that. And the other end will go into your either your little nebulizer machine at home or your flow meter in the hospital room, okay? Once you do that, you can either put a aerosol mask on here or you can use the mouthpiece. Now, if I use the mouthpiece, I'm utilizing this little thing right here. What is this called? T-piece. Also known as the what? adapter. Pigs adapter. This is, but that's the answer you probably gonna see the choice in the test. When they say, what is this? This is the Briggs adapter, also known as the T-piece, okay? All right, T-piece, good. So you put that on here. So I take my medicine, squirt it in the cup, right? <clears throat> now look, these are different types. If you were in class, I would pass these around and you could see. I'm just gonna grab a couple of them out of here. They come in different shapes and sizes, like that, like that, little teardrops. <clears throat> and then like this, you can't even see this one no more. I don't forgot what it is. Metaproteranol. This is metaproteranol, which is metaprel. See that? And then no teardrop. That's just depending on what the medicine is. And all of the medicines will be either on the package and on the actual vial. Okay. So if I look at this vial, you find one that you already know. Okay, so what is this one here, if you can see it? Let me get an interview. You might not can see it, it's, it's pretty. Can't see okay. it. You don't have uh, the package, but let me use this one. The one I showed you the other day, what is this? Apotropin, bromide, and abuterol. It's a com convent. That's a duonib. Duonib, and like somebody said, combivent. Now, combivent is the same two medicines, but as an MDI. So I can give you albuterol adjuvant as a nebulizer called duonib, or I can give it to you an MDI form called combivent. See that? Combivent, which is apotropium bromide and albuterol as an MDI. So just depend on which one you want, right? Same thing, this is MDI, use a spacer, puff it, whatever, right? Or we can give it to you in a nebulizer form, which is like this. So we will open up the foil package, take it out, see? And this will tell you that this is ipotropium. Like I said, you probably can't see this in here, but you will when you get to class. Ipotropium bromide and albuterol. Albuterol and apotropium bromide. I will take this. Oh, oh, package was on the, the thing. Okay, I will take this and pop the top. Take my medicine cup, squirt it in the. And the notice, I'm not touching the cup. All right, 
Uh, it's very important when you're doing the lab and when you're in the hospital, you want to squirt it down in there without touching the actual, you know, out putting your hands out because that's they're about to breathe this stuff in, guys. This should be pretty clean because there's ways to clean it after every use in the in the in the hospital room. And this is coming fresh out the package. But what if you open it up and had it in your pocket or had your hand all over it like this before you and then you touching all around it? That's nasty. So stay above it, put it in there. Notice I got my medicine in there. Okay. Small volume nebulizers have less than 20 cc's, okay? Anything less than 20 cc's is considered a small volume nebulizer, okay? More than 20 cc's, or that's a large volume, okay? Like the big ones we see, aerosol this, aerosol that. They utilize a large volume nebulizer. That's what it is, the jet nebulizer with the Venturi system on top to give you an aerosol high flow oxygen system okay so you can't really see the lines on here or the numbers but there, there's numbers on here each one of these little vials is about three mls okay it's about three mls or three cc's okay three mls all right well, I mean, you can't really see let me see if we sit my hand behind it yeah well it's three mls okay so you take this put your little mouthpiece system on it your briggs adapter mouthpiece on one side, and then a reservoir tube on the other side. Reservoir tube on the other side. The reservoir tube is simply to hold any kind of, so when you inhale, I'm inhaling what's coming from here and whatever is trapped in here. It's gonna be coming out, but when I inhale, not only am I getting the stuff coming, the medicine or aerosol coming from the medicine cup, but I'm also getting what's being trapped in here between breaths, okay? But if I had this off, then this would be losing a lot of your medicine, okay? So this is usually on there like this, and you just slow, deep inhalation with an inspiratory hold for the small volume nebulizer or SVN, okay? So you have all these medicines that you give, but you need to know how they're given. This medicine, Some medicines are only DPI. Some of them are only small volume nebulizer. Some of them are only MDI. Some of them go all three ways, right? So you might give some medicine that you can give it through a small volume nebulizer or you can give it in an MDI, okay? Now, other part of this actual small volume nebulizer, mouthpiece, Briggs adapter, reservoir tube, and medicine cup. But there's also a special feature inside of this medicine cup, right? that makes small big particles into uniform small particles, which you had in your uh, some of your vocabulary. What is this called? A baffle. It's a baffle. It ain't always gonna be purple. It's not always gonna look just like this. Just know anything inside of that medicine cup that fits in there like that, that's the baffle. It could be green, it could be white, who knows? Just depend on the manufacturer, okay? The baffle is a device, a little piece of plastic that will take those large particles and mist them out into small aerosolized particles. If I don't have the baffle, you won't get an aerosol. So if you're doing this and you mess around and, and it falls out and then you put your top on and you give it to Mr. Johnson, he's gonna be sitting there looking at you like this. Nothing's gonna be coming out. You have it turned up, nothing's coming out. It's just gonna look just like this, nothing. And you're like, well, it ain't working. Well, I don't know why it ain't working. Well, it's because you got to look. Oh, let me see. The baffle must have fallen out. Let me get it another one. If it fell on the floor or something, just get a whole nother system and give them the treatment. You have to have the baffle in order for it to nebulize, okay? The purpose of the baffle is not to confuse. It is to make large particles into smaller particles that can be inhaled, okay? This is your small volume nebulizer. All right. Does that medication just get wasted if they don't want um, the whole three milliliters to get used? Oh, they yeah, they go. Yeah, it's just wasted. If they you put it in there and then they, you know, they take some and say, "I don't want no more," make my head hurt. Then you just pour it out and clean out your nebulizer and keep on going. They Do they want it. the whole three milliliters to be poured in at once into the yeah. cup? Yeah, this this whole thing you squirt the whole thing in there. Okay. So the whole three mLs and that's the treatment. Okay, they last about seven to ten minutes. Uh, small volume nebulizer treatment lasts about seven to 10 minutes. 
that's why the MDI and stuff was created because it's quicker. They get the same amount of medicine in a quicker shot. Uh, it's argued um, how much of the MDI is actually going into the lungs and not in the stomach and how much of the small volume nebulizer is making it to the, the lungs and not the stomach. Because some people swallow when they breathe and they swallow it and it's be something in your stomach, which is systemic, right? Uh, but, you know, it's abortion, not abortion, tomato, tomato, it's an argument that'll never get finished, okay? It's gonna have pros and cons on both sides. But in the hospital, your main one for your good medicines that they need uh, for your rescue medicines uh, in the hospital are gonna be um, small volume nebulizer. Okay, they're going to be a part of your small volume nebulizer team. All right. Uh, so this one here is a duo nail. I showed you this other duo nail, but this is a different manufacturer, right? These both have albuterol atrovin in it. This one just happens to be a different brand, okay? A different manufacturer. And this one you might can see. It actually says duo nail. See that? This is a duo nail, okay? Now, representative. Huh? Yasmin, mute your mic. Sorry. All right, that's okay. This one here is, what is this one by itself? What is this? Hypertropium bromide. Hypertropium bromide. What is the trade name for hypertropium bromide? What's the trade name? Somebody should know this right now without looking. What's the trade name for hypertropium bromide? Atrovent. 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 What type of drug is atrovent? What type of drug is atrovent? Is it dry powder? What type of drug? I'm looking for the category of drug. Bronchodilator. It worked. It, it enhances bronchodilation. But what type of drug is a is atrovin? An adrenergic drug. Is well, it a rescue? A, wait a minute. It's not an adrenergic drug. It's not a rescue drug. Anticholeric. An anticholinergic drug, which is on the parasympathetic side, right? Your parasympathetic uses acetylcholine as its neurotransmitter. When acetylcholine is activated, it causes bronchoconstriction. That's what acetylcholine does. So we have drugs that are will block acetylcholine, and they're called anticholinergics. And the only two anticholinergics that you've even learned is atrovent and atropine, right? Because atrovent will block it from constricting. Atrovent will block acetylcholine, right? Because when acetylcholine hits the muscarinic site, it causes constriction, okay? So if I want to block acetylcholine, I need an anticholinergic. And the anticholinergic that we use is atrovent, also known as hypotropium bromide, okay? You need to know that there's only one. There's only one respiratory drug on that uh, that's an anticholinergic that we talk about, and that's atrovent. I did say that uh, Spiriva is also one, which is a dry powder inhaler, but we don't really learn much about that one till you get in the field. So you, that's, that's what, this is how you have to know it. So you can't be hearing crickets when I say what kind of drug is atrovent, and it's just crickets. Okay, you got to know this, guys. Got to. I had all weekend to be flashing yourself on these drugs, okay? All right, let's move on. That's pretty much all of the ones that I can show you right now, all right? I got a mucolytic in here too. I'm gonna show you when we get to that part. All right, now, but there's one thing that should always be done before and after a bronchodilator. Did anybody read that? What's something that should be done? Now, we always get the... Um, heart rate, respiratory rate, the sat, the breath sound, right? We always get that pre and post. Every time you give a bronchodilator, you do your pre and your post documentation. So I'm with the pulse ox on, get their sat and heart rate. I'm gonna listen to them correctly and get their breath sounds, right? 
Uh, but there's something else that you should always get before and after a bronchodilator, which tells us, did it work or not? Okay. Does anybody remember reading that? Something I should get before and after a bronchodilator. The respiratory rate or how they're breathing. Yeah, I did that. Respiratory rate, sac, um, and heart rate. Yeah, we got those. Those are always, you know, but there's something else. Would it, Blood pressure. Would it be the... Go ahead, Michael. Okay. Would it be the, um, where you get the, the TLC, you know, the... Yeah, peak flow. You get the, you get the, it's not the TLC, but it's going to give you what's called the peak flow, right? Remember, when somebody uh, has a constriction, they can't get the air out, right? They're trying to, you know, they're trying to get the air out and it's constricted because it's, so it's hard. So there got to be some type of way to know what their flow is before and after the breathing treatment. So it's called a peak inspiratory flow or a peak flow. This is what it looks like. Anybody ever seen one of these? It's a peak flow meter. Okay. What you do is when you inhale, you'll take one deep breath in and you'll say, oh, one hard breath, right? And that will move this little, this little uh, reader up, right? You blow and it'll shoot. It'll shoot up to whatever your flow is. How much flow are you able to generate with that one forced vital capacity? One forced vital capacity is read through your peak flow, okay? And so if somebody's having a problem and he blow in it, it's going to be kind of low. So I would chart this. So say I got Mr. Johnson to blow into this and he was able to blow out 200. And what's the unit? Can't see that liters per minute, 200 liters per minute, right? That's pretty low for anybody. And how you know what to do or what they should be is by the height, okay? So there's a chart that comes with these that will have uh, a chart that says, has uh, age on one side and height going across the top. So you find out how tall you are in inches, of course, and then you go down to where it says your age and then I have a number. That's the number you should be able to achieve, just regular healthy lungs. So if you're 40 years old and you're five foot five, then there is a special amount that you should be able to blow. If you're seven feet tall and 20 years old, there's another amount, which is way larger, that you should be able to blow. All right. So what we do is we use a peak flow meter after we get their heart rate, their sat, their respiratory rate, and the breath sounds, you'll make them perform a peak flow. Okay. And then after, Mr. so Mr. Johnson did 200, then you gave him an adrenergic bronchodilator, which opens up all of the, 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 uh, the bronchioles. So now when he does it after the treatment, it should be higher, right? That lets us know whether the treatment was uh, helpful or beneficial. It also tells us if he's suffering from COPD, right? Because if I give you this and you give you the treatment and it's way better, then he has some obstruction issues. I want to look a little deeper. Was it just because he smelled somebody's perfume or does he have some real obstruction issues? Okay, because obstruction, uh, people cannot get the air out. So when they blow out and they exhale, they can't get it out like you and I, right? And so since they can't get it out, they build up CO2 and they usually have a lower oxygen, right? That is our COPD patients. So when I give you a breathing treatment, and then I do this. I tell him to do it the second time. And then look, he gets that after the treatment. Now he's up to 300. That means that his breathing treatment was effective. Okay. It was therapeutic. You are opening up their lungs to be able to breathe better. All right. So remember that before and after, always get a peak flow when it's a bronchodilator. Now steroid or exanthine or mucolytic, you don't have to do all that. this for that only for your bronchodilators, okay? Very important, because this helps them manage themselves at home. Because if you're feeling a little bit bad at home and you're testing yourself and you see that you're not getting where you should be, you need to start thinking, am I gonna have to go to the hospital? Uh, when do I need to take a treatment? Uh, you know, I could be impending on something called status asthmaticus. And that is very, very deadly and dangerous. 
Okay, learn that a little bit later. So a peak flow, add that to your pre and post uh, documentation. Has anybody seen this before? Anybody familiar with a peak flow meter? They look different. I mean, this is just one type. Anybody, anybody else? Has anybody seen this before or even know what this is? If you don't, now you do, okay? This is another one called the pocket peak flow meter. See that, look at that. Pocket, the pocket peak. It's the pocket uh, peak flow meter. And it's a different one. It's, I mean, I wouldn't put this big old thing in my pocket, but you know, it is what it is. You hold this on your finger like this and you blow. This little blue meter will shoot up to where you should be or wherever you are. Notice we got the stoplight colors here, all right? So when you're doing it at home, guys, you your best, 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 like say I say I found out because I don't have the paperwork that shows you where you should be. You can look it up online, uh, calculate my peak flow and it has put make you put your age in there and your height and it'll tell you what you should be, okay? Uh, but whatever the green is, is where you should be. So if they say, Michael, and you should be able to blow out uh, 400 liters per minute. And this old as hell. See that 400, see that? Y'all see that, uh, the green on about 400, it's a little bit higher. See that? Does everybody see it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, that's where you put the green, where you should be. Okay, and then um, wherever your lowest has ever been is where you put the red one. And your, the key is to try to stay in between the yellow and the green. Okay, so the middle number, so say I do it four, three times. I'm going to put the green where I should be, and my lowest one is where I put the red one, right? And so I want to stay in between this uh, yellow and green as much as possible, right? When I blow into it, right, it should go, this little blue one will go to where I am. If I start blowing into this, guys, and I'm down near the red, then that lets me know I need to take a breathing treatment. I need to go and get my MDI or my uh, my uh, small volume nebulizer, adrenergic bronchodilator to go and let me dilate and then blow it again and see if it's better. If it's not getting better and it's not responding but getting worse, then I need to call my doctor or prepare to go to the emergency room but that lets you know that an asthma attack is pending, right? Sooner or later, you're gonna have an attack. And so that's this is how home patients monitor their uh, obstruction, okay? This is how you monitor. And this is a cool one, a little pocket peak. You put your little finger in like a trigger, right? You put your thumb right here on this little, little notch right there. Put your thumb there and your finger through here. And then, right, it's got a hole and you just blow through there and that will move this meter, okay? And like I said, you can look up after class today, I want you to look up where you should be. So go on Google and type in peak flow calculator and then email me, it's not your homework, I just want you to email me your number, okay? And that way, when we get to class, we can do these, put a filter on and everybody can do it and see where you are, see if you are close to where you should be or are you far away? Some people have asthma, that's so mild, but it's getting more moderate, but they don't recognize it. And if you're right around in your red range, you need to say, I need to make me an appointment so I can get a pulmonary function test to see what's going on, especially if you're a smoker or you're around somebody that smokes, okay? So this is a peak flow. This one is a peak type of peak flow. And this is an old school peak flow. Look, see the numbers there? And there's a little yellow thing in there and the hole here. You just take it, blow, and it will make that little yellow piece. Let me see if I can see that yellow piece there. Make it move, right? And it tells you where you are. All right. Always get that pre and post bronchodilator treatment. Okay. Any questions on the peak flow? What about the one you use for uh, the patient that has pneumonia? What about them? Is it like, is it the same like those? What do you mean? The same peak flow? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's just peak flow is peak flow for anybody. No matter what you got. If I want to get a peak flow, I that's what I use. Oh, okay. 
Mm-hmm. All right, so let me pull up the, the uh, lesson plans. Microsoft is acting up. All right, let me open it back up. All right, pharmacology. Lesson plan. So let's we're at our long acting bronchodilators. All right, here we go. Let's share my screen. Here we go. Mm. All right, here we go. Salmeterol, which we said is the generic name for Cerevent. This is how it comes. Uh, 12 hour duration. So it's long lacking, lasts for a long time. But look, look how long it takes to start. 20 minutes to an hour for onset. So this is not a emergency medicine, right? Not for emergency. Because if I uh, have an asthma attack and I pull this out, it may be an hour before it comes out. That's one minute is too long for somebody who can't breathe, okay? For meterol, for motorol. For motorol is another long acting bronchodilator that is the generic name for foradil. Foradil. Foradil is given as a dry powder inhaler and gives you 12 unigrams per puff, right? So in that blister, there's going to be 12 unigrams of medicine, right? You give it one puff twice a day, 12 hour duration. So that's why you give it twice a day. And this is like management, right? This is uh, uh, respiratory issue management, like asthma management or something like that. COPD management, somebody who needs these long acting bronchodilators, even if you're not having an attack at that moment, you just take it every 12 hours to keep you open. It's just giving you bronchodilation all day. Okay. Uh, and this one takes five minutes. Now you say it's got, it's five minutes. That's not long, but can you hold your breath for five minutes? No. Right. And if you can, you don't want to, because it's going to be suffering if you do. So it says, even though it has a rapid onset and peak effect, it's better as a maintenance drug than a rescue agent. Takes five minutes, but that's a long five minutes if you can't breathe, all right? All right, so those are the two long-acting bronchodilators, salmeterol and fomoterol, okay? You need to know uh, the trade name and the duration and stuff like that for these, okay? Now, prophylactic. Prophylactic drugs are, prophylactic and management are almost the same, but management will be something that you're still at the hospital, you know, and we're giving you these every 12 hours to kind of keep you open or whatever. We're managing your issue until you get better, right? Prophylactic would be this person is fine, but they take medicine every day to prevent something from happening, right? Prophylactically, like condoms, right? Condoms are used to prevent. That's why they're called prophylactics, right? Condoms and other female uh, prophylactics are used to prevent STDs and pregnancy, right? And so the same thing with respiratory. We have prophylactic type drugs that will give you just because you're taking them, right? This will just keep you going because I know you got COPD or I know you have pneumonia or we know you have uh, uh, interstitial lung disease, you've got, you know, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, whatever your issues are, right? You, you're diagnosed with that and you're going to probably have that forever, okay? Once you got COPD, you have it forever, all right? So if you're smoking, you need to stop now uh, to prevent it, okay? But prophylactically, this is something they take at home every day, okay? 
Now, first one is fluticasone uh, propropionate mixed with salmeterol. And that is the lovely Advair that I showed you, the purple one, right? The purple one. Fluticasone and salmeterol is Advair. This is a prophylactic medicine. Okay, this is a prophylactic medicine. Comes as a DPI discus, right? So that's what discus means. Looks like a disc, a little purple disc. And it has three strengths. It has either 100 unigrams of Flovent uh, with 50 of Cerevent or 250 unigrams of Flovent mixed with 50 of Cerevent or 500 unig unigrams of Flovent mixed with 50 uh, of Cerevent. And all three of them are given twice a day, maintenance only or prophylactic, you should have said prophylactic, not for emergency, okay? Not for emergency. Right. The next prophylactic medicine is chromium sodium, which I just talked about. Right. Showed you that. <clears throat> well, I showed you needle chromium sodium, but chromium sodium. Chromium sodium is a prophylactic drug for asthma patients. OK. And pro, uh, uh, chromium sodium is the generic term for Intol. OK. Intol is the trade name for chromium sodium. How does it work? This is very interesting. It stabilizes the mast cell, thus preventing histamine release, okay? So what does that mean? When we have a mast cell, okay? I'll draw you the mast cell right quick. And I'll use red as the histamine. All right, so we have a cell called the mass cell. Ooh, I hate the way this sounds. I had to do that. That's my flesh crawling. Let's use this right here. All right, so the mass cell. This is chromium sodium in action. You have a cell in your body called mast cells, okay? And inside the mast cell is histamine, okay? You have a mast cell and inside the mast cell is what's called histamine. And histamine, if you know histamine, or ever heard of an antihistamine, right? When you're sneezing and eyes are watering from pollen and dander and dust and all of those different things that you're allergic to. Histamine is what's causing your eyes to water and your nose to run and sneeze and cough, okay? Eyes to be itchy, that's histamine, okay? Histamine and leukotrins. Now, histamine, what happens is in the mast cell, M-A-S-T cell. In the mast cell, you have histamine. As long as it's inside the cell, you don't have a problem, right? You don't even have a problem. But what happens is the histamine is there because you're like, well, why would the, your maker make histamine? Because what is histamine's job is to do is to attack allergens when they come into the system, like pollen pet dander, all those things. When those allergens come into the system, the histamine is released and goes to attack those allergens. But the, the presence of the histamine itself causes the runny nose. And that lets you know that your body is fighting those allergens, okay? If you are allergic to it. Some people are not allergic to pollen. So they don't, the histamine just sits in the cell like, well, I don't have no problem. She don't have a problem with that. So I'm gonna stay here, right? So when what happens is for, um, but also not only the itchy eyes, but it causes bronchoconstriction, okay? Histamine can cause bronchoconstriction when it's loose in the bloodstream, okay? So the mast cell, what happens in that mast cell? Well, the mast cell, those histo uh, those uh, dander and pollen will break open the mast cell degranulate. It makes the wall of the mast cell fizz away, right? Or degranulate. And then the pollen, I mean, not the pollen, but the histamine is released. 
So once you get the pollen or the pet dander or whatever it is you're allergic to, it breaks the walls of the mast cell down and this histamine is released into your system, all right? Well, if I don't want this to happen, I need to find a medicine that will strengthen the mast cell, right? I find a medicine that will keep that mast cell from degranulating, okay? If it already has the granule, what, what's some medicine that you take when you, you got allergies? And, uh, you know, what, what's on over-the-counter medicines that you take for allergies? Benadryl. Um, Benadryl. Benadryl. Benadryl, what else? Claritin. What? What'd you say? Claritin. 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 Uh, uh, Zyrtex. Yeah, Zyrtex. All that kind of stuff. Those things fight either histamine, they're antihistamine or leukotrin inhibitors. Okay. Singulair is a leukotrin inhibitor. We'll talk about that when we get to that. So chromium sodium, I say all that to say. That chromium sodium, when it comes along, it will protect the mast cell and prevent it from degranulating. All right? Chromium sodium will prevent... Where are my glasses at? Chromium sodium will prevent it from degranulating. So let's look at it right here. Chromium sodium, which is known as Intol, right, will put a bounder, boundary around the mast cell. Okay. Intol. The intol will come and put a coating around the mast cell, which prevents it from releasing the histamine. Okay. That is something we give prophylactically to asthma patients because uh, the histamine, when it's released, it can cause bronchoconstriction. And we don't want that, right? So we will do that, okay? So that's what chromium sodium is for. Here it is. Chromium sodium, known as Intol, will stabilize the mast cell, thus preventing histamine release. It is indicated for the management of chronic extrinsic asthma and also effective as a prophylactic in patients who have intrinsic trinsic asthma. Extrin who can tell me what extrinsic or intrinsic asthma are? What are, what are, what are what are that? What does that mean? And once we get done with chromium and sodium, we'll take another break and come back. What is intrinsic and extrinsic asthma? What is that? Is it asthma that doesn't respond to any medication? Oh, that would be a status asthmaticus. What's what, what what's the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic? Anybody can guess. Inside and outside. Good, okay. So using that logic, extrinsic asthma is, is asthma that is triggered by something from the outside of the body, right? So that's pet dander, pollen, smell of uh, cologne, whatever, right? Uh, uh, medicines that you took, being around a power plant that's got pollutants in the air. Those are all extrinsic, okay? Intrinsic asthma is something that's caused from inside, like stress. A lot of people didn't know that stress can cause an asthma attack, right? So stress, laughing, okay? Laughing real hard can cause an asthma attack, okay? And you just somewhere just laughing, laughing, then next thing you know, you take that breath and it's not there, okay? So that's, so chromium sodium, since we're talking about histamine and allergens, of course, it's more used for extrinsic asthma, okay? but it's also known to help with intrinsic asthma, but mostly extrinsic, right? Something from outside the body, all right? Now, the key to prophylactics though, prophylactics take about two to four weeks to reach maximum levels in your blood. So it's not going to, it's not going to protect the mast cell on day one, okay? Just like some depression medicines take a month to finally get to the level to where it's effective, okay? So prophylactic is something you got to do every day. It's not something you can just grab every now and then. It's just wasting time, right? Just like Paxil and, and um, any of them other uh, depression medicines that some people have to take. They have to take it every day. Those bipolar medications, psychotic medications have to be taken every day, okay? So it stays high in the system 
for a while. You can't have a bipolar mania episode, take one pill and you back to normal, okay? It's going to take a minute for that to get to where you're calm again, okay? So pro prophylactic drugs take about two to four weeks to reach maximum potential. So don't use it during an asthma attack. Yes, we use it for asthma, but don't use it for asthma attack because it's going to take four weeks before you can breathe, all right, if you're going to sit there and do that. Chromium sodium, how is it given? Well, it's given as an MDI at 800 unit grams per puff or small volume nebulizer. That's what SVN is. Small volume nebulizer with 120 milligram ampule, right? You give that one ampule four times a day, okay? All right, that's chromium sodium. It's used to prevent the mast cell degranulation. Used to treat chronic extrinsic asthma, somebody who has bad asthma, has been having it all their life, you know, the real bad, the one that's always got his shoulders up because they always have an asthma. They waiting for an asthma attack, right? Chronic asthma. <clears throat> all right, next one, which I showed you, nidochromium sodium. And we're going to take a break here. It's three o'clock. Let's come back at 310. And we're going to go over nidochromium sodium. Nidochromium sodium. Uh, when we come back from break. So I'm going to pause the recording, come back at 3 o'clock, I mean 310, and we will go over nidochromium sodium. All right, so we're back from break. We are now into nidochromium sodium. We're talking about our prophylactic drugs, prophylactic respiratory medicines, which are our fluticasone propropionate mixed with salmeterol, which is known as Advair. We talked about chromium sodium, which is known as intol, and it prevents the breakdown of the mast cell, okay? And now we are talking about nidochromium sodium, which are the sisters. Nidochromium sodium, known as tylade, is uh, also a prophylactic medicine for asthma. It also stabilizes, stabilizes excuse me, the mast cell, but look, it also has some anti-inflammatory properties, right? So not only do we treat uh, asthma issues, right? But that inflammation. So sometimes it's inflammation. See how it's red inside of there? And it should be pink, right? But that red will sim sim uh, signalize some inflammation. So you might have uh, not only constriction, but inflammation, because the inflammation will cause swelling and any more uh, swelling may take up more space inside of that um, bronchio, causing it even harder for you to breathe, okay? So if you have inflammation with that, then they'll give you nidochromium sodium. It's indicated as a part of a treatment regimen for management of chronic allergic uh, bronchitis and asthma. Blocks the early and late asthma responses to a variety of aller aller allergic and non allergic triggers. Prophylactic, but it takes what? Two to four weeks to reach maximum levels. Now, neochromium sodium is given as an MDI and it provides 1.75 milligrams per puff and usually give it two puffs QID. Now, I think it's also given uh, as a, a small volume or whatever I showed you, uh, but just go by what you see here. Given as an MDI, 1.75 milligrams per puff, two puffs QID. That is neochromium sodium. All right. Now we're going into another category. Now, remember these categories. We started with the sympathetic or aka adrenergic bronchodilators category, gave you all those medicines. Then we talked about the uh, parasympatholytic drugs, which are the anticholinergic. It is a column. We also talked about the exanthines, right? That is a category, right? The category of exanthines, which block phosphodiesterase, right? Remember, phosphodiesterase comes on the scene after bronchodilation, and it wants to go back to normal tone. So after you have bronchodilation, phosphodiesterase comes on the scene and say, all right, that's enough. This I want to go back to this, which is normal, right? But if we're not ready to go back to this, or the doctor does not want you to go back to this yet, we can take a drug called um, exanthines, which will block phosphodiesterase. 
And the two exanthine medicines were theophylline and aminoophylline, all right? So those are that category. And then we talked about the category of uh, corticosteroids, whether they're inhaled and oral, right, or PO. And we had a list of the uh, corticosteroids that we inhale, and we had one that we take by mouth, which was prednisone, right? All right, and now we are up to our long-acting bronchodilators, which I told you those, your long-acting bronchodilators, right? <clears throat> then we got down to our uh, prophylactic, that category, which is your Advair and your Intol and your Nidochromatum sodium, right? And now we are at the next category, which are your leukotriene inhibitors. Okay, leukotriene inhibitors. Now, what are leukotrienes? Leukotrienes are very close to histamine, okay? But leukotrienes are mediators of inflammation, edema, and bronchoconstriction. If they're loose in the system, they're causing these things, okay? <clears throat> Leukotriene activity can be inhibited by the syn synthesis inhib inhibition or blocking receptors. So I can block a leukotriene by giving a, uh, I don't know if it's called an anti-leukotriene, but it's a leukotriene inhibitor, okay? A leukotriene inhibitor is a medicine that once put it in a, in a bloodstream, it will see leukotrienes and block them from doing what they do. Let's just make it simple. Leukotrienes, if they're loose in the system, they cause inflammation, they can cause edema in the airways and bronchoconstriction, okay? So you can take medicines that will stop them or block them, okay? The first one is Zafirlucast, okay? Now, Luke, see that Luke? You already know that's a leukotriene inhibitor. But Zafirlucast, also known as acylate, acylate, right? Zafirlucast is the generic name for acylate, and it comes in 20 milligrams tablets, BID. We can give that. Okay, the next leukotriene inhibitor is one everybody knows, which is Montelukas. Montelukas is known as Singulair. I'm sure you all have heard of Singulair. Well, that's what Singulair is. It's not an antihistamine. It's a leukotriene inhibitor, okay? Because histamine and leukotriene, they do about the same thing. I think leukotriene is a little bit more, you know, stronger than histamines are but leukotrienes and histamines are close related. They do about the same re reactions to the body, okay? And so Montelukas, which is the generic name for singular, is a leukotriene inhibitor, and it is in 10 milligram tablets once a day. So you see, you get a singular, you don't have to take it every hour or every four hours, you just take it once a day, okay? Once a day for these allergy drugs. All right, then Xylutin. So you shouldn't have a problem with the leukotriene inhibitors because they all sound the same. Zafir Lucas, Monta Lucas, Zylutin, right? Those are all leukotriene inhibit inhibitors. Now, Zylutin is also known as Zyflo, and it comes as 600 milligram tablets four times a day. Now, I told you when we started 210 that um, ABGs and pharmacology will be your biggest nemesis okay but it's not mean you can't handle it it just means you got to put more time in these two okay now that's the end of that category that's the end of the leukotriene inhibitor category the next category will be your antimicrobial agents now these are stuff that's going to fight actual bacteria okay we got medicines we can give that are uh that fight bacteria that fight Fungus, they fight different things, viruses, right? Well, so the antimicrobial agent category is in subcategories. The first subcategory of your antimicrobial agents are antibiotics, okay? Antibiotics are drugs that fight bacteria, right? There are other bacteria that eat other bacteria. The, the top ones we use for the antibiotics are tobramycin, and gentamicin. Tobramycin and gentamicin are two antimicrobial agents in the antibiotic subcategory. 
they treat most gram negative organisms. Now, what are the gram negative organisms that it treats? Well, Pseudomonas. Remember I told you Pseudomonas, you can smell it from the room. Somebody has a tray, it's, it's real thick, yellow, nasty, brownish secretions that you can smell them from the hallway. And it all smells the same. When they have Pseudomonas, it has a particular smell. And you know that's got Pseudomonas, it's really strong. You still gotta go do what you gotta do but it's pseudomonas, okay? It's a gram-negative organism. You're gonna learn the difference between gram-negative and gram-positive when you get to 220, okay? They're gonna break that down real good for you in 220, okay? Pseudomonas is seen a lot in our cystic fibrosis patients. So not only is the little baby going through a lot, but his secretions are real foul smelling. The next gram-negative will be acinetobacter. Acinetobacter, then Klebsiella, and enterobacter. Those are all some gram-negative organisms that tobermycin or gentamicin would be used to fight. Now, the way we find out, just like any other disease or uh, bacterial infection, we would take a sputum sample. So we would suction the trachea, if we can get that, or we can get them to uh, uh, induce sputum, right? To make them cough up a sample for me, cough up a good hop loogie, spit it out, and I go run it. If I see Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, Klebsiella, or Enterobacter in your sample, then I know that either Tobermycin or Gentamicin will kill it, right? So what we do is what's called a gram stain. We'll take a little Petri dish, right? With your stuff in it, and then drop some Gentamicin on it and see if it kills the bacteria. If it doesn't, it means it's not sensitive to Gentamicin. So I wouldn't waste my time giving it to you because it ain't gonna kill it, right? But if I drop tobermycin on it and then all those bacteria die, then that's the one I need to give you, right? So I would, the doctor would prescribe tobermycin, inhale through an aerosol, okay? You breathe that on, you know, it usually takes about a week or so, but that will kill your disease, see? Antibiotic. It will also treat some gram positive like staph. Sometimes it's been known to treat spad, uh, a staph and usually preceded by bronchodilator. So usually when you give an antibody, they want you to give uh, a bronchodilator first, okay? To open you up real good, okay? Preceded, okay? So that's the antibiotic subcategory of the antimicrobial agents, all right? The next subcategory is antiviral. There are some medicines we give for viruses, okay? But the only one you want to learn about is ribavirin. Ribavirin is treated for respiratory syncytial virus, known as RSV. If any of you have kids and had a baby who had RSV, they gave them ribavirin nebulizer, okay? Inhaled ribavirin is a antiviral respiratory medicine that kills that virus, okay? But it's indicated only carefully in selected infants and young children with severe lower respiratory tract infection. That's what that is. That RSV is severe. It can kill you. It can kill the baby if you're not careful. Now, ribavirin can't be given in the SVN like you think. It's got to be given in a special nebulizer because you don't want to catch it. You can't breathe in ribavirin if you don't have it, okay? You don't they don't want that loose in the air. So it's given with a, spa, a small particle gen, aerosol generator, generator known as a SPAG, small particle aerosol generator. That's a SPAG, okay? SPAG, I implore you to look up on YouTube the use of a SPAG generator, right? A SPAG, so you can see how, how it works. How does it actually work, okay? So that's the antiviral, and it's only one, which is ribavirin. And how we, what do we treat ribavirin? RSV. We're treating RSV with ribavirin, okay? Anybody in here had a kid that's had RSV, or does anybody know about RSV? Heard about it? Yes. My nephew had it. Okay. My daughter had it. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's what they gave your daughter with ribavirin, okay? Or should have. All right, the next subcategory will be an antiprotozoal, all right? Antiprotozoal, and that is pentamidine isoethanate, 
which is known as nebupent. Pentamidine is nebupent. Pentamidine, nebupent, okay? That is our antiprotozoal medicine. It also must be given with a special nebulizer. See this? With a special one-way valve and scavenging expiratory filter and preferably in a negative pressure room or under a hood. You are not supposed to be breathing in pentamidine. Now, pentamidine is given to your AIDS patients, okay? If you have an AIDS patient, they're probably getting pentamidine treatments, okay? And I'm, I'm, I'm sure they may even be giving them to coronavirus patients now, okay? But the reason is because AIDS patients, not to treat the AIDS, it's because when you have AIDS, you're vulnerable to a special demon called pneumocystis corona pneumonia, okay? Pneumocystic or cystis uh, corini pneumonia, which is PCP, PCP, okay? Pneumocystic corina pneumonia is a special, huh? For what, what's wrong? Okay. All right, pneumocystis corona pneumonia, which is PCP, is a, a real terrible pneumonia that is the pneumonia that's actually killing the patient, okay? They don't necessarily die from the AIDS, they die from the complications, right? They always say this person died of complications from AIDS. Well, the complications will be either malnutrition, uh, but mostly it's the pneumonia that is uh, in the system because of AIDS, because when you have AIDS, your immune system is completely down, right? It says seen in immunocompromised patients such as AIDS. Your immuno, immune system is down. And so pneumocystis corona pneumonia is out there looking for somebody who is weak, right? Somebody whose immune system is devastated from a ravaging disease. Finds that AIDS patient, gets in them and bam, okay? Now, when you catch pneumocystis corona pneumonia, you don't even feel it because you don't have that immunocompromised immunocompr situation, right? But for AIDS patients, it, anything can kill them, right? Because they're it's like they're totally wide open to whatever. And so that PCP gets into them and kills them, okay? And so if they have AIDS and they're suffering from PCP, we will give them pentamidine, okay? Which is known as nebupent must be given with a nebulizer with a one-way valve uh, in a negative pressure room. That means the room, when you shut the door, the air goes out through the roof. So if I have a negative pressure room and I shut the door and I take a piece of uh, tissue and drop it by the door, it should suck under the door. That lets me know that that, pressure has, that room has been pressurized negatively. Any of your tuberculosis patients or your uh, uh, coronavirus patients, they are in negative pressure rooms. They should be. Most hospitals don't even have many. Like the LTAC where I work, we got two rooms. Out of the 25 rooms, only two of them are negative pressure. Because you don't see that a lot, right? You don't see that a lot. But they're probably going to start making more now. All right. So that is the antiprotozole. One medicine, pentamidine. Okay. Then you have your surfactant replacement. Oh, we remember surfactant? Remember what, where surfactant is made by the type two cell? Well, this is for premature, right, early, right? Or low birth weight patients with uh, infant res uh, respiratory distress syndrome, okay? Primarily because they have a lack of surfactant at birth. So if they're born too soon, their clara cells haven't developed all the way yet. And the clara cells is what produce surfactant. So if a baby is coming out, Without that surfactant, their lungs are like a dry sponge. So when he hits that air, it's hard for him to pull in a breath, okay? So we have to immediately give them some surfactant, all right? And so how do we give it? Well, first of all, the name for the two drugs that we give that are surfactant replacement are Cervanta and Exosurf, right? The name should, a lot of these names should give our dead giveaways, guys. Cervanta and Exosurf are two surfactant replacement drugs, okay? 
And so this baby will have to be intubated, which means we have to put a tube down his little bitty body in, into his little lungs, right? And then pour or instill via the ET. That's the endotracheal tube. ETT is the endotracheal tube. That's a tube that goes in the mouth and into the trachea, okay? Right above the carina. It sits right above the carina, so anything coming out of it goes to both lungs, right? And so we drip some exosurf down that tube and then bag the little bag into his little lungs, forcing it into the lungs. It's just like putting water on a dry sponge. As that water is put on the sponge, it gets more and more malleable. Now the baby can take that breath, okay? Now the baby can take that breath, okay? That is surfactant replacement for your preemies or your really, really light, uh, low weight babies. They develop what's called infant distress syndrome or infant respiratory distress syndrome because of lack of maturity in their type two alveolar cells, okay? All right, now we talked about equipment already, so we can go through this. Equipment, of course, is small volume nebulizer, MDI, dry powders, and spacers. We've already gone through that. I showed you that. If there's even a uh, PowerPoint in this module that goes over those devices, so make sure you look at those devices. There's pictures and everything that talk about those devices, okay? So we've done that. Now we're almost done. We got mucinetics, surface acting, and that's it. Two more. All right, mucinetics or mucokinetics, right? Mucokinetics is the movement of what? What do you think that is? What we're trying to move? Mucus. Mucus, all right? Now, this is gonna start from like just a little bit of wet water all the way to prescription medicine, all right? We already said that we give humidity and we give aerosols to moisten the airway, right? To help produce a better cough, to move mucus, right? And then when that wetting agent is not necessarily getting it, we can position them, right? Into a certain position. And if that don't work, we can percuss on them to beat it out of that segment or put a vest on them and shake the whole thoracic area, right? Then we got devices we can use like the PEP therapy, the flutter therapy, right? Those things we can use to shake the lungs when you exhale, shake. Right now, if I got this, I got one in here. Yep, here's one right here. This is uh, known as a uh, flutter device. It's a different type of flutter device, right? You can make it stronger or weaker. Okay, so it's got a mouthpiece, but I don't have the mouthpiece. Well, I want you to listen to it as I do it. Okay, so if these wedding agents and stuff have not worked, the positioning, this is one of those devices called aerobica, right? And what you do is, I want you to listen. Take some breathe in and blow out. You hear that shake? I'm feeling that shake on my lungs as I exhale. And that helps shake some of that secretions off of your lungs, okay? So if all that stuff don't work, now we have to start putting out the big dogs, okay? The mucokinetics that are uh, actually prescription strength drugs, okay? So first we start off with dilutants, which are just wetting agents, like the aerosol this and the aerosol that. That's a dilutant using distilled water, right? Uh, <clears throat> thins the mucus, makes it easier to move, right? Okay. That's stilled water. That's what we use in our aerosol this and our aerosol that. Using humidifiers, right? Uh, osmolarity. Now, this is how salty something is, okay? It's called um, hypotonic. Hypotonic uh, saline, right? Just this is hypotonic. Uh, it will be absorbed into the interstitial space of tissue. And sometimes it can cause edema. Remember we said that if you got too much water and the body's not able to get rid of it, you got to be careful because it's going to start causing edema. Hold on one second.
Oh, never mind. Okay. So be careful. All right. So that's distilled water. That's what we're using in our uh, humidifiers and our large volume nebulizer. Hold on one second. All right, so I'm gonna put on here using humidifiers and LVNs, which are large, vo large volume nebulizers, okay? Large volume nebulizers, okay? Now, isotonic saline, now this is the, uh, also known as normal saline. Isotonic saline, guys, is known as normal saline. It's the same osmolarity as the lung. So, like sweat. You know, if you ever tasted your own sweat, it's kind of salty. Well, that's the same taste uh, normal saline is. It's the same as the lung. Your body, your tears, uh, your sweat, all of that comes out as a bit salty, which is your known as normal saline. That's the osmolarity of the lung. Okay. Now, uh, it's also known as 0.9% saline. So you need to remember that isotonic saline is 0.9%. Now, this is not concentration we're talking about. Hey, something in my nose. Okay. Is isotonic saline is 0.9% saline. That's talking about the osmolarity, guys. This is not talking about concentration. It's not a drug. It's just saline, okay? It's usually, just like those vials I showed you, it's usually a pink vial like that. The pink vials are your normal saline. I got a pink one in here. I don't have a, I don't have a pink one, but the pink, oh, here it is. It's always pink. Your normal saline looks like this. There's a little pink vial. It's always pink. This is just straight up normal saline. We use normal saline to dilute medicines, like if medicine's a little too strong, we can squirt this in the in the cup as well to dilute medicine, right? We can this uh, sometimes these are used to squirt up in your little nose, your baby's nose. Just not all of them, but just a couple of squirts will loosen up that stuff in their nose. Whenever you have those medicines that spray up into your nose for babies, that's just normal saline. That's all it is, normal saline, also known as isotonic. It's the same as the lungs. Okay. Then you have hypotonic saline. Hypotonic saline is less than 0.9%, so it's less salty as the your tears or your sweat would be, okay? So it's known as hypotonic saline. So it will be less than 0.9% saline because 0.9% saline is normal saline. Anything less than that is hypo, right? Which means low. Hypotonic saline is that. Osmolarity is usually absorbed into the interstitial space. It's used, a lot of times we use this in the ultrasonic nebulizer due to the evaporation of water. Uh, okay, uh, from the oh, evaporation of water from small particles thus becoming isotonic by the time it reaches the patient. A little extra. Uh, and it can increase airway resistance. What you need to know about hypotonic saline is that it's less than 0.9. It's usually half of that, which is 0.45%. Okay, that's all you need to know. Uh, that hypotonic saline is half saline, half of normal saline, right? Which is 0.45%. Or anything less than 0.9 is hypo. Okay. Hypo. Now we get into we're starting to this step. This all this is not working. Now we're about to start stepping it up. This is the last step before prescription is hypertonic saline. Hypertonic saline is greater than 0.9% saline. It's usually about 5%. And this is going to be very salty. So it's like your sweat times 10, right? It's very, very salty. But it's used to induce sputum. Notice that's another color. Why do we give hypertonic saline? To induce sputum. So if I want you to cough something up, I can give you a treatment 
of hypertonic saline. And as you breathe that in, that's really breaking stuff down because it's so uh, salty and it's going to break that stuff down and cause you to be able to cough up some more. So why do we give hypertonic saline? Everybody say it. Why do we give hypertonic saline? To induce sputum. To, to induce, induce sputum. sputum. There you go. All right. Osmolarity, hypertonic. So it's greater than 0 0.9. 0 0.9 is normal or isotonic. Anything less than 0 0.9 is hypotonic. And anything greater than 0 0.9, which usually is about 5%, is hypertonic saline. And that's used to cause um, induced sputum. Now you gotta be careful because it can cause a bronchospasm. It's so strong, like salty, it can cause a bronchospasm when they take it in. So you have to be careful when you're giving them that, okay? See, it says draws the fluid out of the interstitial space. So if you have any fluid or secretions in between the cells, it's gonna draw that up and make you cough it out. Okay, it's not like salt. Whenever we have salt, what does it do? It draws the, it, it absorbs your, your, um, your fluid, right? Water, it holds water. Anytime you take a, a high salt diet, you're gonna have a lot of water weight because the salt is absorbing all of that water and it won't let it go, okay? So if you wanna get rid of your water weight, get rid of the sodium in your diet. Now, Water weight is volume. So the more volume I have, the higher my blood pressure. That's why they say, if you have high blood pressure, watch your salt, because the salt will make you hold on to volume and volume is synonymous with pressure. Okay, never forget that. Volume and pressure go hand in hand. So that's hypertonic saline, okay? If that don't work, now we're getting ready to get into the mucolytics. This is the prescription mucus movers, okay? The first one, acetylcysteine. And you will need to know how each one of these mucolytics work because they work different. They all have a claim to fame. Mucomist, acetylcysteine is, now this is not acetylcholine. A lot of people get this mixed up with acetylcholine. This is acetylcysteine. Is the generic form of a, of a drug called mucomist. Now, mucomist is one of those, I'll let you smell it when we get to class, but mucomist is funky, okay? It smells like rotten eggs because it has sulfur in it. No, sulfur stinks, smell like rotten eggs. Well, this is the mucomist, acetylcysteine. Acetylcysteine, known as mucomist. Okay. It comes in a 10% or 20% solution. Now, when I talk about 10 or 20%, I'm talking about concentration now. All right. Because we're in prescription now. So I'm going to put over here concent okay. concentrations. We're talking about prescription now. All right. How does mucomis work? Everybody must know it will be on the test. It works by breaking down the disulfide bonds of mucus. Your mucus is held together by two sulfide bonds that keeps it thick. Mucomis, don't wet it up. It doesn't make it more wet, none of that. Mucomis actually goes in and breaks those bonds. Then that stuff just start coming up, okay? But it smells like rotten eggs. So when you're giving this treatment, the whole room smells like rotten eggs. Okay. It's indicated for thick mucoid secretions. When they're so thick that you got to use something other than just some water, right? You got to use prescription. Now, it's so strong that you have to use it with a bronchodilator. So when you give mucomis, right? I'm going to take some of this, put it in my nebulizer and a duonel or albuterol or bronchosol or metoproterenol, whatever. One of those bronchodilators I need to give with the mucomis. In the field, you're going to see they usually use albuterol or duonel, okay? Because it's going to cause a bronchospasm if you give it alone, all right? So if you see an order that says mucomis, give it to them Q6 and that's it, then you need to call the physician because it should be given with the bronchodilator. Hey, doctor, whatever, whatever. I see you ordered this mucomis on Mr. Johnson. Can we get a, 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 a bronchodilator to go with that? Oh, he or she will say, oh yeah, my bad, I forgot. You're right. Go ahead and add a, a bronchodilator to that, okay? 
it can cause nausea because it's so funky. It's, it's stink. You know, it's not nasty. I've tried it. It's not nasty. It just stinks. But it can cause nausea. Okay. Discard after 96 hours after opening. Okay. So what you need to know about acetylcysteine, which is mucamis, how it works, the concentrations it comes in, right, and that it should be given with a bronchodilator. All right, so we're in that mucolytic category. Next drug in the mucolytic category is sodium bicarb. Hmm. Sodium bicarb, we've heard that before, right? The no, normal bicarb in the system is 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter. Bicarb is a base, right? Well, sodium bicarb will raise the pH of the sputum, which makes it break down. Because what does bicarb do to pH? It's a base. Okay, so what's it going to do to the pH? You got a lot of bicarb. The pH make it more alkal alkaline. Make it more alkaline, which raise goes up, right? The higher the pH, the more alkaline you have, right? So that's what it does. So, so when we give sodium bicarb as a breathing treatment, it's going to raise the pH of the sputum, which will make it break down, okay? It comes in two to five milliliters of a 2% solution, and you can give it three to four times a day. Sodium bicarb to move that mucus or to break it down, right? To break down the mucus. Okay. The next drug for mucolytic is deoxyribonuclease. So that right there gives it up about what it must do, right? Uh, deoxyribonuclease is the generic form of Dornavac. Dornavac is the trade name for deoxyribonuclease. And how does it work? Deoxyribonuclease works is a protolytic enzyme that breaks down the DNA bonds of the sputum. Okay, so it actually goes in and breaks the DNA down of the sputum. Because don't forget, you have DNA in your spit. So if you don't want nobody to know who you are, don't spit around them. Because if they swab it, they know who you are. Okay your DNA. So it breaks down the DNA of the sputum and reduces the viscosity, right? Breaks it down. See, everybody doing something different, a different way to break down the actual mucus. When it's real thick and the, the uh, hypertonic saline not working, CPT, positioning, PEP, flutter, none of that stuff's working. Now we need to give you a prescription, right, to actually go and break those bonds down or to break the DNA down, right? Or to raise the pH to make it thinner, okay? This is what's going on now. It comes as a 50,000 to 100,000 units aerosolized up to four times a day. All right. The next one, and this is a special one. This is Dornay's Alpha. Dornase Alpha is the generic name for pomozyme. Pomozyme is given to your CF patients. Write that down and put a highlight around that. Whenever you have a patient with cystic fibrosis, we're giving them Dornase Alpha. Okay, we're going to give them Dornase Alpha. Okay, that's going to be one of the drugs. You're also going to probably be giving them Tobramycin as well, right, because of the Pseudomonas. But the pseudomonas is just a bug that's in the mucus, right? Pseudomonas is not a special type of mucus. It's just a bacteria that's in the mucus that stinks real bad. And it's, it can kill you because it's a bacteria. So we can, but you can have thick mucoid secretions with pseudomonas in it, right? And so now I need something to treat the pseudomonas, which will be the tobramycin or the gentamicin. And I also need something to break that mucus down which will be the Dornase Alpha. That's what we use for them, okay? Pomazine is the trade name for Dornase Alpha. It is genetically engineered peptide protolytic enzyme. How does it work? Now, it breaks down extracellular DNA in perlic secretions. So it's close to the Dornavac, but a little bit different. See, they got the name is close. Dornavac just breaks down the DNA bond. Dornase alpha actually breaks down the extracellular DNA in perlic secretions. What does perlic mean? Somebody tell me what perlic means. 
What is Pearl? Something is pearling. What does that mean? Anybody? It's containing something. Yeah. What does it contain? What do pearling secretions contain? What is pearling? It's Anything charging pus. 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 Pearling means pussy type secretion. So that's mucus that's full of pus. That's why it's so nasty, okay? Because pus, you know, remember, pus is formed because of dead white blood cells. So when you have a and that's, bacteria- That's a sort of infection, right? Yes, when you have a bacteria infection, the white blood cells come to the infection and fight it out. The ones that get killed turn into pus. So when you see a wound that's got pus coming out of it, that's because, not because it got infected, it's because those white blood cells came and are being killed okay so if you have an open cut yes you got to be careful because there's infections everywhere right there's bacteria everywhere and so if that bacteria gets down in that cut then it's gonna start getting warm because the blood gonna start coming bringing those white blood cells to it and as those white blood cells fight it out with the bacteria some of them win some of them lose the ones that die are turned into pus so when you see pus you know you got an in, you know you have an infection because the white blood cells are there and they only respond to an infection okay white blood cells only respond when there's a bacterial infection okay and so you see how cystic fibrosis can be a terrible terrible disease all right so we give donase alpha for them uh, because they have pussy type secretions all right we manage perlant mucoid uh, secretions in patients with cystic fibrosis so cystic fibrosis is what we use Dornase Alpha with, okay? 2.5 milligrams, which is one little ampule a day. They have to take one of them every day for the rest of their life. Now I'm telling you, cystic fibrosis will have this much stuff at their bedside. They got devices, medicines, therapies every day. It's, it's, it's gotta be a terrible existence. As things get better and as you guys make it, find something to help them because they are suffering, okay? They are suffering. The last drug of pharmacology are your surface active agents. Surface active agents are known as ethanol. Ethanol is the uh, Trey is the generic name for ethyl alcohol, which is vodka. Vodka. We can nebulize vodka, right? We do that for pulmonary edema. Write that down. Ethanol alcohol, aka vodka, is given as a small volume nebulizer to treat pulmonary edema. And reason why we do that is because pulmonary edema, guys, is not, it's, it's, when you see pulmonary edema, it's usually pink frothy secretions coming out of somebody's tray or they're coughing up froth, like the beer, like you drink a beer and it's got froth at the top or pink frothy secretions. If they're coughing that up, that's pulmonary edema. And we can't suction that because it's like bubbles. As soon as you start suctioning, they just pop. They rot, not really, uh, you, you can't get them and you suck in air, right? So we have to find a way to turn those bubbles into some liquid that we can suck out. And the only way to do that is to change the surface tension of those bubbles. And you do that with vodka. Okay, now don't go trying this at home because you got a nebulizer at home and you put a little vodka in it. You will get a buzz, okay? You will, it, you will feel it because the lungs are immediate, right? Aerosol is immediate. Not as fast as IV, but it's just as fast, you know, second fastest. So as soon as you inhale that, you're going to start feeling the effects of the alcohol. But it can be dangerous if you're doing it for recreation because it's bypassing the liver, okay? When you drink alcohol, it goes into your system and goes through the liver, and the liver will, will scrub it before it gets to the bloodstream, right? And then you start feeling the effects. That's why alcohol kills your liver over time, okay? 
But if you inhale it, you bypass the stomach, you bypass the liver, you don't have no, you don't, no hangover, stomach hurting and all of that. But you can die from alcohol poisoning if you do too much because you didn't, you bypass that liver. All right. So we have to be very careful. We only give five to 15 mLs of 30% to 50% vodka every 30 minutes to two to four treatments. And we use it for pulmonary edema. How does it work? By, like I said, it alters the surface tension, thus popping those bubbles and causing you to be able to have a liquid that you can actually suction out or they can cough up to get it out of the lungs, okay? All right, so when they have pulmonary edema, it's like the, the alveoli is a, a bubble bath. If you were to look inside the alveoli, it'd just be bubbles popping everywhere, right? And that's taking up space. They can't really breathe because you got that stuff in there. But you can't suction, I can't cough it because it's just air, right? So we give that uh, ethyl alcohol, AKA vodka, and it will make those bubbles turn into a slush or a, you know, a liquid that you can actually suck out. And you can treat them like that. That's how you treat them, okay? They don't do it as much as they used to. Uh, but I even said, my idea was, since we know that alcohol kills coronavirus very, very well, that if you have, and, and coronavirus is primarily a lung disease. And since we already give uh, ethanol treatments for pulmonary edema, that why not give our corona patients ethyl alcohol treatments to see if that can kill some of the virus, okay? And nobody's listening, but you best believe I got it on deck because if I become, contact with it, and I know you got it, I'm going to go home and do one of these, all right, just to be on the safe side, because it's not something that's made up. This is something that we already do, already approved by the FDA. Now, public service announcement or disclaimer, I am not uh, telling you to go out and use vodka, aerosolize. I'm just telling you that we do use it in respiratory for pulmonary edema, and there's some other things that probably could benefit from it if you study it and look into it but you best believe you can kill yourself with too much of it because you're bypassing the liver, okay? So that is ethyl alcohol, surface acting. Now, it can cause a bronchospasm, right? It can cause irritation, dehydration. You know, when you drink, you get mouth be dry, right? So, so will your body. If you get too much of it, it can cause dehydration and of course, alcohol intoxication. So it's contraindicated in patients taking antabuse, right? Antabuse is a drug for alcoholics that are trying to with, get off of alcohol. So if Mr. Johnson has been off the wagon for two, three years, right? He's taking antabuse, which is blocking the effects of alcohol, right? He's taking, uh, he's trying to be sober and then he have a little pulmonary edema. Here you come talking about, well, let me hit you with some vodka. Now he, he off the wagon, okay? You gotta be careful and selecting who you give this to, but we definitely do give it, okay? So don't be surprised what you see, guys, when you get to, uh, and that's it. Don't be surprised what you see when you get to the field, uh, when you go into your, because I've even seen Paps Blue Ribbon beers be in the, the medicine cabinet, because you got some people that are struggling with disease, but also struggling with substance, alcohol, stuff like that. And if they are alcoholic real bad, they have some beer that they can give them to help. Just give it to them a little bit, give them a little bit in a little CC cup just to get that taste and a little bit to because they are suffering, shaking, all kind of stuff when you're uh, withdrawn from alcohol. Okay. So be careful and don't be surprised. Like what? I got beer in here. Don't say nothing like that. Okay. Don't, don't do that. That's something that you will see. All right. That is the end of pharmacology. Now, I know you know it is a lot, okay? It is a lot. So I'm not going to give the test tomorrow. Hopefully, we'll be back on campus tomorrow, but I got a feeling we're going to end up home all week. Um, it's been a trying couple of weeks with this ice and disease and all of that. So hopefully, we'll be back on campus. Uh, if not, we will be doing review tomorrow from home. If we are on campus, we're going to be reviewing from campus, okay? Just doing a review, go over some work, um, you know, on the board, what drug is this? Maybe do a little bit of um, um, 
little games or something like that where we can practice on these uh, drugs. But you need to be studying this uh, right now, all night. Make sure you know those specific sympathomimetic drugs uh, and all the other drugs, how they work, the categories. You might have a question, now that you know this, you might have a question that says, what drug, this drug is used to treat inflammation of asthma, right? It's a prophylactic drug that we give for asthma and inflammation. That's it. Then you might have a list of five different drugs to pick from. You got to know that that's nidochromalum sodium. It's not zopinex. It's not top. It's not, um, not tylate, right? It's nidochromalum sodium, which is, no, that is tylate. It's not in talk, right? So you got to know these drugs. And sometimes I get mixed up too, but you got to know them. Make your note card so that you can make sure you are practicing with your spouse, your kids, or whoever, so that you understand pharmacology and also know how do these drugs work. You know, if I tell you I want to block fossil diasteries, you have to tell me what drug or what category would I use. I'm looking for a drug in the methyl exanthines. Remember, Exanthines may also be named methyl exanthines. As long as you see exanthines, those are blocking your phospho diasterase. Okay. Uh, it's just basically you, it's on you now. Okay. I've given it all to you. You have to take this serious and put the time in. Tomorrow, review, be ready to talk to me and not be hearing crickets when I ask a question because uh, I'm going to be calling on individuals to tell me what this is, what that is, because you need to know, all right? Um, study, go back over your workbook if you're not sure, but those are some great uh, way to, to dig down deep into this information, okay? So I will see you guys tomorrow. If you have missed your test, you're able to take it today. Remember the deadline I told you to take your test. If I were you, I'd take it as soon as possible. So if you want to take, if you missed your test, and you want to take it now when we get off this, this Zoom call, well, not get off the Zoom, but when class is over. If you want to take this test, you need to let me know in the chat. Don't say it out loud because I don't even know who missed and who didn't. Put it in the chat and I will open it up for you virtually to take in front of me now. If not, you don't have to say, I'll wait. You don't have to tell me nothing. All I want to know is if you plan on doing it now. If you don't, then I won't see nobody and I'll end the class. If you do, then you take it. Uh, put it in the chat and tell me yes I'd like to take it I will open it up for you and let you take it uh, right now okay now, for everybody else you can go have a good day I'll see you tomorrow and I'll let you know in the chat or whatever uh, email or announcement where we will be tomorrow I'm sure you will see it too when you get that email from Concord the homework has already been assigned in the module so just go look up the homework for today it's due by 11.59 p.m. and it's written all out in the module. Uh, it's ready. It, was, it wasn't going to open up till four. So now it's four o'clock. It should be open now for you to do. Okay. Everybody else, you're free to go. And if you plan on taking your test, put it in the chat and I'll open it for you. If you want to wait, then I'll see you all tomorrow. Miss McCarthy. Okay, I got a quick question. I know we like our schedule all over the place right now, but you know, we missed the uh, two labs last week and we had the one, you know, for today. Mm -hmm. Is it possible if, that they will allow us to like possibly, because the time I know is like at a very minimum because we got finals coming up next week and all that good stuff too. Um, is it possible for them to let us go with watching the lab videos that you put up? With no, like connecting gotta, the stuff or you got to do the lab? No, you got to do the lab. We're going to have a makeup lab day. Uh, I'll let you know what day that'll be to make up the lab that we missed. Okay. Um, like I say, it's only this, you know, I've got a couple, well, this one and then one more. And so uh, after that, we'll have a, a makeup lab day within your time frame. Uh, and it, it may even be after the final, because if you don't pass okay. the final, then there's no need for you to even do the lab, right? Because if you don't pass, well, I'm, I'm going to say that. If you don't pass the final and it fails you, put it like that, if a student takes the final and whatever grade they get fails them, then if you if you don't pass 210, there's no need to even take them the um the lab, right? You can you're gonna have to do it again next time anyway. So that will 
take some of the amount of students that have to make up down some, okay? So that's how we'll do that. So for right now, we're just gonna set up a keep on going like we're going uh, day by day. And I'll let you guys know what day we're going to make up the lab, all right? And we'll just have a lab day to make up everything we missed. And then it will probably be, like I said, after the final, because like I said, if, if just say four or five people don't pass 210, well, those four or five people won't have to come and make up no lab because they're gonna have to do it again next time around, okay? So that'll, that'll, that'll knock some of the amount of people down some. So I'll let you know and keep you posted on when we're gonna make up those last two labs. Okay. All right, I don't have anybody. Maria, did you plan, Maria, did you plan on taking it today? I know you asked me about it. Oh, there she is. Did you plan on taking it, Maria, or not? I can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So everybody else can go. Um, because class is over. I'm only going to do now, uh, I'm about to stop recording and start um, anybody that was going to make up a test. I only have one person. So everybody else, I, I'll see you later.